Hi, this is Carl Winkler at Electrosonics. Uh, this is the first of four videos or wireless side chats that were originally done for Facebook Live during the COVID-19 uh, lockdown. And I thought we'd uh, go ahead and put these up on YouTube so you could watch them uh, at any time and share them as well. Hope the information is helpful. Thanks for watching. All right, so this session is Intro to Spectrum. What have we gotten ourselves into? This is a very basic session covering kind of the fundamentals of frequency spectrum and how we fit in. I always like to start with an illustration of the relative wave sizes <clears throat> and the frequencies. And uh, what you'll notice is the frequencies that we tend to use are actually right around this size in terms of their wavelength. And there's a reason for that. Uh, the propagation characteristics are excellent, and at the same time, we can have practical antennas. Now, in the older days of VHF systems, <clears throat> excuse me, we had longer antennas, of course, because the frequencies were, were lower, and now with UHF and the, and the ever higher frequencies that we're looking at, the antennas and the wavelengths get much smaller. And it is interesting, though, all this is a continuum with uh, visible light as well. Here's another look at that, uh, showing more specifics about the frequencies, 300 hertz, 3 kilohertz, 30 megahertz is kind of where we see some radio get started. Here's FM broadcasts at 88 to 108 megahertz. And then we get into this region with most of what we do, visible lights way up here, X-rays, gamma rays, and so on. Here's a little bit of a closer look uh, with the slots that we occupy doing what we do. Uh, marked out. So the VHF is down in this range, 174 to 216 megahertz. And then UHF is up in this range, 470, now up to 608, and in some countries up to 700 megahertz and even a little higher. Uh, there is the ISM band at 915 megahertz. It's uh, 902 to 928. We have a little slot of about 20 meg wide uh, at 941 to 960 megahertz. There's the 1.4 megahertz slot, uh, and then 1.8, 1.9 is uh, decked. 2.4 gigahertz is your typical Wi-Fi frequencies, and we do have some wireless mics there. 5 gigahertz is up where uh, the Neutrixerium system is. It's a point-to-point -point wireless system. And then 6 gigahertz is where Audio-Technica and Alteros had their ultra-wideband system, which has been discontinued. So that shows you that we have very few slots uh, to fit our, our equipment and get our job done uh, in the available spectrum. Another way to look at this is that all the spectrum that is available is shared with somebody. Uh, this particular trace was done in 2002, so we see that there are analog television stations of varying uh, distances and powers, as well as the first few DTV channels in this spectrum, and then there's some open spaces in between. And the open spaces, of course, is where uh, our wireless carriers have to fit. And I think most of you that are practicing uh, the craft now know this, and you see a lot worse spectrum than this. This is uh, quite some time ago, uh, 18 years ago, and the spectrum was certainly more open then. And one of the things that we used to be able to do with analog television is fit some uh, some of our carriers in between the picture carrier and the sound carrier of analog television. And with DTV, as long as the signal's fairly strong, that's no, no longer possible. So here's another way to look at all of what's happened over the last 20 years. Kind of what the slide I just showed you looked like this top section here, where you had analog TV transmitters and then wireless carriers in between. And we had everything from 470 to 806 megahertz here in the United States and in most countries. Uh, so uh, the transition started up in the late 1990s to go to DTV. This was the digital dividend. And at first it was shared. D DTV broadcasts went on the air along with analog TV broadcasts. So they were simultaneous and many stations had both. And gradually over the years uh, that went away until in 2010, uh, there was only digital television uh, left in terms of full power TV transmissions. And they had auctioned off the 700 megahertz spectrum in the United States, which is happening in other places in the world now. So we had less spectrum, <coughs> excuse me, uh, remaining available uh, for our use. 
Then uh, the FCC got the idea from Congress, actually, uh, in 2012 that they would look at another auction selling off the 600 megahertz spectrum. And that's what's happened. That was completed in 2017-2018 uh, uh, after four rounds of auctions. And uh, they, they grabbed another 84 megahertz. So you can see that what we have left now is actually less than half of what was available 20 years ago in terms of spectrum. So uh, it's made our jobs tough, I think, as everybody knows. I certainly do, and I'm sure all of you do, that are using wireless mic systems out there. And, uh, you know, you should know that the industry has, in many ways, banded together. Uh, that's on the left is Joe Cidelli from Sennheiser. That's Jacqueline Green from Audio-Technica. That's Mark Bruner from Shure. And myself from Electrosonics visiting the FCC uh, in 2014 to lobby them to increase their understanding of what was really going on because the FCC really didn't have a handle on how many wireless microphones were out there. They had ideas that it was just a few hundred or I think there was 900 licenses at that time, the Part 74 licenses. So we got together in Washington for some meetings with them to get them up to speed in terms of the fact that there's millions of wireless mics out there being used and that really changed their outlook on how the auctions would be run and what kind of spectrum should be left and how important content creation is. Now, clearly, we lost spectrum, but it would have been much worse had the industry not banded together and lobbied them uh, to bring them up to speed, as I said. So how far back does all this go? Well, this is actually a photograph taken by Dan Dugan. You can see him in the reflection there. Uh, at one of the AES conventions where they had some of the uh, audio museum things. Uh, so this is a, uh, the first tube amplifier made by Telefunken in Germany in 1912. Look at the size of that tube. It's, it's most likely a triode. I, I'm not sure pentodes were invented yet at this time. Uh, so there you go. And just a scant five years later, uh, this is a diagram accompanying a British patent for a wireless microphone system for cinema production. Uh, so you see here the camera, the film camera, of course, and a wire recorder. There's a recording head there. And the actors are each wearing what appears to be kind of like a backpack type setup with a simple uh, radio transmitter and a carbon microphone. Um, and I love this, the antenna poking out over their heads and also the ground wires dragging on the stage, which is Looks like it's, it must be a conductive stage because they have it marked as a ground. And then the receiver antenna here, transformer, triode, going to a recording head. So even in 1917, they knew uh, that they wanted to do film production and capture uh, what the actors were saying with wireless mics. Pretty amazing. Now, we don't know if this was ever used. I doubt it was. Uh, it does not appear to be particularly practical to me looking at this. But it gives you an idea that for over 100 years, we have known that this is how we want to do this. So what were the first practical systems? Uh, those started much later. Uh, it looks like in the UK in 1947, Aladdin on Ice used a wireless system at 76 megahertz. Uh, I don't have much more detail than that, but it's an interesting thing that it was for uh, um, a live production. And then uh, in the United States, 1951, they started using it for baseball broadcasts on NBC. I'm not sure what frequency that was. 1953, sure, uh, came up with the Vagabond system. And I love this, the description of the range. It's got 700 square feet of coverage, which means that it's a radius of about 15 feet. So not terribly wonderful, but, you know, it's, it's a start. And Germany in 1957 came out with Microport, and theirs was at this 37 megahertz, the low band VHF frequency range. And in the U.S., the first patent granted in 1964 uh, was to meet the needs of TV, radio, and classroom instruction. Pretty interesting. Again, they, they already knew what they wanted to do with it. And then in Japan, 1958, uh, low-band VHF used by Sony uh, for theater performances as well. So pretty interesting stuff. Um, where do I come into all this? Well, the system that I used in the 1990s was an older, at that time, Vega system, very high quality system uh, in the high band VHF range. This was actually a very good system, diversity receiver, um, single frequency, and uh, VHF, obviously, 
uh, but it had quite good range and it sounded quite good if it was upkept. And we had it regularly maintained by a gentleman in the Washington, D.C. area. So let's look at some of the technical breakthroughs. Um, in 1976, Nady, John Nady, used the first audio compander. He borrowed it from telephone technology. But that started to push the quality of what could be done with wireless, uh, given the amount of spectrum that we allowed to occupy with each channel. Definitely increased the uh, signal-to-noise ratio. And the early 1980s, uh, Electrosonics came out with a plug-on transmitter, and we still make those today. It's one of our most popular products, uh, able to convert any, any mic to a wireless. In fact, this is one of the first products I ever saw in the 80s when I worked in a music store in Tucson, uh, was the uh, M33 plug-on type transmitter. And of course, I had to try it with my guitar, and I don't think it sounded very good, but uh, it was cool. And uh, by the late 80s, various manufacturers were looking at frequency agile systems. Uh, so, uh, and then, of course, everyone started to migrate to UHF because it was wide open at that time. Uh, and so the, the combination of frequency agile and UHF is the basis of most of the products you saw by the mid to late 1990s. The very first digital wireless mic that I'm aware of was made by XWire, a U.S. company in California. And it was that company was later bought out by Sennheiser, and they came out with a product called the Digital 1000, which never really did much for them. Uh, but X-Wire later became X2, and X2 was purchased by Line 6. So, and then Line 6 was purchased by Yamaha. So there you go. And as it turns out, I found out recently that a former Electrosonics employee now works for Yamaha doing wireless mics. Interesting, small world. Various manufacturers, uh, mainly for law enforcement at that time, started using uh, recording transmitters, which is fascinating history there. Uh, in the early 2000s, Electrosonics came out with the encrypted digital wireless system, the uh, 700 series, uh, which was, you know, uh, actually did fairly well for its time. Very difficult to build, an expensive system, uh, but a lot of corporations bought them at that time in the early 2000s, up to about 2005, 2006. Uh, transmitter remote control became uh, viable in the mid-2000s. A couple companies doing that. Um, the first digital IEM was from Electrosonics in 2011, the Quadra system. Short-lived, but interesting. Still the lowest latency wireless that I'm aware of at 0.9 milliseconds. I don't think anyone's beat that yet. Audio-Technica uh, came out with an ultra-wideband digital system at 6 gigahertz. Really interesting technology. I think they foresaw maybe earlier than anyone else, the, uh, the shift in frequency availability. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it didn't end up commercially viable, but they really pushed some boundaries. Sennheiser's 9000 series was a very top-of-the-line system that came out in 2015 and uh, has been used in some theaters and uh, is really interesting. And they have an uncompressed mode that sounds really, really good. Uh, the digital Axiant series from Shure came out in 2017 and the Electrosonics Duet, which is still in our product line, which has done very well. And then the, uh, the D-squared system in 2019. So you can kind of see a, a continuum of development and the push into digital in the last uh, 20 years and how almost every manufacturer is completely digital now or at least has uh, digital products in their line. So why go wireless? Well, the first uh, reason, of course, is freedom of movement. And you saw in that historical thing about uh, covering sports events and uh, theater productions, Aladdin on Ice, so freedom of movement and freedom of stage design and production design is a big reason to go wireless. Uh, you can get sounds this way that you can't get any other way. And uh, for those of you, of course, who know, uh, you know, uh, NFL Films has used our products for many, many years. That's Scott Carter on the right. Um, and that's Kansas City Chiefs, obviously. That's some years ago. I believe those are SMQ uh, or SMQA uh, transmitters. This is some time ago. And of course, as I mentioned uh, just a minute ago, freedom of production design. You know, if you got wireless cameras uh, and wireless mics, you can really move quickly and get interesting shots and be mobile, where you just simply can't do that with wires. In fact, I remember uh, talking to Daryl Frank a few years ago when Breaking Bad was all the rage and how they had gone to all wireless because the cables kept getting dragged around in the dirt and everything was super dirty. And going wireless uh, really solved that problem. Of course, the speed of response for news gatherers 
And uh, it's interesting looking at this picture now, it's like all these people all jammed together it feels very <laughs> uncomfortable because of the social distancing we have to live with at the moment uh, because of the pandemic. But anyway, obviously news organizations are heavy users of wireless for this reason. And then creative stage design uh, related to the freedom of movement. Uh, this is a production of the Steve Jobs Opera up at Santa Fe Opera a couple years ago. And they, uh, it was really a landmark production in many, many ways. The staging was super minimalist, as you would expect to, to be the story about Steve Jobs and Apple. And uh, Santa Fe Opera is a world-class opera house just up the road from us, about 45 minutes away. And uh, of course, longtime users of Electrosonics being in the neighborhood. So of course, along with all these amazing things that wireless can do, uh, there are more headaches. And uh, those really uh, start at the cost per channel versus a cable. I mean, five times to 50 times the cost of a cable to get the same job done is one way to look at it. And sometimes it is worth looking at that. You know, with all the spectrum crunch that we have now, um, we, of course, advocate that you use only the wireless that you need and no more than that. Um, what else? Of course, it takes more expertise to use wireless systems. Uh, and that's why you guys are tuning in. You want to learn more. And of course, I'm, I'm glad to always be a resource at trade shows to talk with you guys and, uh, and things like this. Of course, now that we have social distancing and NAB's canceled, and I just learned that Infocom is canceled, I'm going to be doing some more of these training sessions. So thanks for tuning in and letting me work out the kinks here. Clients expect magic. Yes, this is true. We all know this. And especially for live events, but boy, if anything goes wrong in the sound system, the first thing they look at is the guy doing the wireless. And they go, you know, WTF, why is the wire, you know, what's going on? And sometimes it is the wireless, but sometimes it's not. And, and it takes some convincing to get it through to them on occasion. This is one that Tim Veer of Shure always says, is like every time you uh, add a wireless channel, uh, supposedly quote unquote wireless, you add three new wires, a network cable, a wire from your uh, receiver to your mixer and maybe a wire into your transmitter. It's kind of funny to think about though. Batteries and battery management. This is obviously a big one and everyone knows the world is going rechargeable, which is a great thing. Uh, it ultimately costs less uh, and it's much better for the environment. Uh, but wireless systems do require battery management strategy, uh, which takes some doing until you get used to it. I would say that churches are way ahead of the curve, having gone, uh, you know, rechargeable many years ago and figured out how to make it work. Live tours have been going wireless, and I think pretty much everyone will, uh, you know, gone with a rechargeable uh, soon. And also this, because of the spectrum crunch, you know, the less expensive systems really don't work well anymore, mainly because of filtering in the receiver. Some t in some cases, it's the power of the transmitter. But a lot of times it's the receiver filtering, which is getting more and more difficult to design, and you're seeing system costs generally increase and get more complex because of this. And, uh, you know, a little system that might have worked okay in your church a few years ago now is uh, getting beat up because the spectrum is so uh, noisy. And, of course, we've all been through this together many times, but the FCC regulatory changes affect all of us and, and frankly cost us money and there's really no recompense from the government, at least here in the United States. In some other countries there has been, which is a nice thing. Uh, I don't think it ever covers really the cost, but um, you know, we got to keep our eye on the ball with what the FCC and the government is doing because Spectrum is very, very valuable and that value is only going up. All right, guys. So I'm going to wrap this one up. I know it's a short one. It's really just kind of an intro course. And uh, then I'll be looking in on the, uh, the thread to uh, check in on any questions or comments. And then in about 40 minutes, uh, we will start the next session. Stay tuned.